Revelation chapter 1. As you open there to Revelation chapter 1, I I want you to realize something. Sometimes we just go through, it's kind of like, yep, there we are again. Do you realize what you're opening to this morning? This is the single longest book in the Bible written specifically to the church. Do you realize that? This is longer than any other book of the Bible that is specifically written to Christ's church. This is the biggest one of all. This book, it's 22 chapters, it's 404 verses, is given by God to show Jesus Christ to the church. Wow. This is vital for us. This is, this is as vital a, a place to go in the Bible that we could go as church members to find exactly what it is God wants from us. Secondly, as we open to Revelation, it's the only book personally addressed by Christ to his church. Remember, all the other ones come through someone else. It's the Spirit of God prompting Paul or James or, you know, for, for Peter to write to those scattered. But this is the only one that Jesus said, I want these words to go to my church, specifically, personally targeted by Christ to us this morning. It's also the only book with a description of what Jesus Christ looks like right now. Remember Isaiah 52, 10 to 53, 6, talk about uh, he's despised and rejected his face, his visage is more marred more than any man. That is a description of, of how horribly disfigured Jesus was on the cross, but if you search through the scriptures, there's no description of what he looks like, except here. This is the only physical description of what Jesus looks like and what he's doing post-resurrection. In fact, you know, it says in Hebrews 7 that he's ever living for his church. He's ever living to intercede. He's ever living to be the great high priest. Here we see him doing that, dressed like that, and performing that priestly duty. This book also is the book that mentions the church specifically more than 63 of the 66 books of the Bible. There's only two books of the Bible that mention the word church more than Revelation, and that's 1 Corinthians and Acts, but it's only two occurrences more. I mean, we're talking about the greatest concentration of information that God wanted his church. And this morning, as born-again believers, this book is addressed to us. It's vital The final word to Christ church. This is the only book that captures Christ's final message to his church, his last words. You know, usually uh, when someone rattles off a list, like, you know, we're getting ready to go and hope we make our plane this afternoon, and they've already canceled it twice, and, you know, I can't believe we're on standby. It's very exciting. But you know what? When we go out the door, the last things we say to the children are the most important. You know, last words. If you were with a beloved parent or grandparent at their death, everyone clings and listens and wants to catch those last words. These are Christ's last words to us. They are vital. It's the only book that comes with God's special promise. It's a blessing to everyone who reads and listens to this message and keeps. You see, that's, that's one of the distinctives of this book. It is not just information. I guess that's why it's been so argued over so long. It's not just kind of like take it or leave it information. God said, this is so vital that I'm personally going to pour out my blessing, not just if you hear someone read it to you in an early church or, or actually are the reader or today have your own copy. It's not enough to just let it fly. He says, I want you to keep I want you to hold and apply what this says to your life. That is vital. Well, look at the first word of chapter 1. The first word of the last book of the Bible is the word revelation. It means to uncover, display, and reveal or show. So immediately God says, hey, look, I want to show you something. So his final words are him telling us, apocalypso, I, I want to show you something. Then the next two words are Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the entire 22-chapter book is is focused on Christ. See, that's, that's what makes this book so wonderful. It's finding Christ in every chapter, in every event, in every portion of this book. He is the target. 
And he is the risen and glorified. It's not Jesus walking Galilee anymore. It's Jesus as the risen and glorified God incarnate, the Son, who is seen as he ever is this moment. Remember Hebrews 7? He ever lives to do what we see in this book. The target of the message of the first three chapters is a word. You know how they, um, the computer has this neat thing. I, I know what they call it, word something. It's, it's where they'll take a document and the computer analyzes it, and it gives you kind of a, a little block of words, and whatever word is the most, it's big. And then the second is second biggest. And, and it's, it's kind of like a picture of what is emphasized within that document. If you did one of those word maps of the first three chapters, do you know what word would be huge? Church. The word church is repeated 20 times in these three little chapters. It's the church that he wants our attention. Well, let's look at seven lessons from this first chapter. If we were just going to overview Revelation 1, we would see exactly where God's going in this. It's kind of like the table of contents for the book. It's, it's what he wants us to know. Number one, Christ is revealed in verse 1. Look what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave for him to show his servants. And those servants are, look at verse 4, the seven churches. So it's a revelation of Jesus Christ for his church. Jesus Christ is revealed for us. This is not for Israel. This is not for the Gentiles. This is not for the tribulation. This is for us. This whole book, all 404 verses, are a revelation, a gift from God to us. The whole book was sent to remind us about a way we need to understand Christ's present work. Now that he's risen and glorified, he is unleashed to be everywhere with every one of us all the time so that we, in his power, can do what he left us here to do. It's, it's, it's a marvelous thought to think about why God gave this to us and what he wants to remind us of. Secondly, look what verse 1 says twice. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his and what does your English Bible say next? Servants. Yep, good. And then it says, things which must shortly take place, he sent and signified it by his angel to his, what? Servant John. Two occurrences of one of the greatest words in the Bible to describe who we are. That word douloi is the word, it's the only word that from the first to the last book of the Bible universally describes those who are going to be forever with God. We are not called believers, those going to heaven are not called Christians in the Old Testament. They are called God's douloi, God's slaves, God's servants, his bond servants. This is the only universal term for who's going to heaven. In fact, when you get to Revelation 22, it doesn't say that, that Christians are in heaven. It says God's douloi, his slaves are in heaven. Now, this, this is an unfortunate, one of the unfortunate translations of the Bible. The word servant in the Bible times and today has a different meaning than a slave. Uh, a, a wealthy landowner could go to the corner day laborer's block and look over the men and hire them to come and work in his fields and trim his vines or pick his crop. He could agree on a price, pay them, and they're gone. They don't have any other relationship to him. They are day laborers. They are servants. They work for him and they leave and they get paid for it. That is not this word. This is not someone that has rights and can choose to work or not. This is the word always used for a slave a bond slave without a choice. Believers in the church are God's slaves. That's why his servants of verse 1, mentioned twice, are the ones that the letters goes to in verse 4, and that's the church. So, so what we are today, from God's perspective, if we're truly born again, are slaves. God tells John that the way to reach his servants is to send this letter to Christ's church. And Christ's Christ's church is made up of these people God looks upon as douloi or slaves. Do you know what a slave was? They had no identity outside their master. If you look in the ancient world, there were Nero's slaves. They didn't come up and say, hi, my name is, you know, so-and-so. They said, I'm Nero's slave. They had no identity that was separate 
from their master. They had no possessions, including their body, that was not owned by their master. They had no right to do anything separate from the will of their master. You see, we aren't servants of God in the sense of that word. We can take it or leave it. God says we're slaves. A true follower of Christ has no identity apart from Christ. It's not about us. It's about him. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know what that means? Empty me of anything to do with me. It's all about you. A slave is what we are to be. And, and you know, that's not a popular thing. You know, today the goal of the, the visible church is to get as many people in as possible. I mean, people are just doing everything they can to fill the churches. Did you know that, that even when Jesus himself was preaching, when he explained this idea of them becoming his slaves, do you know what it says? Look at the end of John chapter 6. He said, you're, you're mine if you eat my flesh, drink my blood, and if you absolutely become those who will obey me. And you know what the people said? We don't like that. And the majority of the people that followed Christ, the tens of thousands he fed in the feeding of the 5,000, by John 6 and about verse 66, they left. You know why? They didn't like the cost of discipleship. They didn't like the, the will of another controlling them. Do you know how you know if you're a slave, you don't mind being told what to do? And that's what we're supposed to do. And when we open this up, we don't mind being told what to do. You know, it's really interesting. Someone recently talked to me and they said, you know what, you're really legalistic when you preach. I said, really, how, what do you mean by that? You mean I, people think they're going to heaven if they do what I tell them to do? No, you tell people what to do. I says, I tell them or the Bible? They said, both. And they said, and that's legalism. I said, really? That's also the gospel, that you must submit to obey God or you don't even see him forever because only people that see God forever are his slaves that they do his will. Remember Jesus said, Matthew 7, many are saying to me that day, Lord, I was in church, I did everything, I taught and I gave and everything, I went on trips. And he says, yeah, you did all that stuff, but I never knew you, depart from me. You never did the will of my Father in heaven. A slave is someone who does the will of another, not their own will. That's why Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. The third thing we see, number one, is Christ is revealed for his church. Number two, we're bond slaves of God. Number three is, look at verse three. Responding to God brings blessing. Now, there's an unusual, unusual blessing attached to this word. I, I, I want you to notice something about it. It says in verse 3, blessed is he. So, so blessings are poured on the person who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And it's not just reading and hearing. It's not just going to church and getting it. Look what the next thing is. And keep those things which are written in it. That word keep, word is tereo. It's a big word in the Bible. Tereo is the word that's used for when, when the apostles were captured by the religious leaders in Acts 4, it says that they were put in prison and kept. Do you get the idea of that? They're, they're guarded and watched. It's a word that's used when Paul was captured by the Jews and torn apart and the Romans got him and they took him to Caesarea. And in chapter 24 and 25, it says he was kept in jail. That's the word tereo. It means guarded. It doesn't mean they just stuck him somewhere. It means they watched him and they carefully made sure they didn't lose him because they were responsible to have him. Now, how does that apply to us? Well, turn back with me for just a second to Matthew 28. Now, you all know this, but I want you to see it anyway. The Great Commission has this word in it, the very same word. It's interesting that just before Jesus left the earth to ascend back into heaven in his ascension, he met with the disciples, and those men that were going to carry out his message, he commissioned them. We call that the Great Commission. It's the last two verses of Matthew 28. In Matthew 28, Jesus sets the the tone for the church, what, what all of us were saved as his bondservants to do. And he says this, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name, I'm in verse 19, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, and the very next word in verse 20, teaching them to, the very next word in the New King James is, observe. 
It's the same word from Revelation 1-3, tereo. It means to guard, to watch over, to cautiously make sure they keep sight of. What? What are we supposed to, what's the, what was Christ's commission to disciples? Teach everyone that becomes a disciple, a follower of Christ, to observe all things I've commanded you, to guard that you're doing what I left you to do. We are here not for fire insurance purposes. The Lord didn't save us to just give us a pass so we can go to heaven. He saved us to be his slaves, to not have a plan about my life on earth that doesn't completely correspond with his plan. That's what it's all about. Matthew 28, teach the new believers to observe, to guard, to keep. That's where the blessing is. The blessing is not material blessing. The, mater- the blessing is not financial blessing. The blessing is not uh, prosperity and health. You can be sickly and poor and immensely blessed by God if you keep his word and say, Lord, I'm checking in, I'm your slave, what do you want me to do today in the nursing home or in the hospital or, you know, in the, in the broken down nothingness of what I have or in my opulence, it doesn't matter, I'm your slave. Okay, back to Revelation 1. First lesson, Christ revealed for his church. Second lesson, we're the bond slaves of God. Third lesson of this chapter, responding to God brings blessing and by the way, this, this word that, that look at in verse 3, this word keep those things, that's the same word that Christ used to describe those who abide in him in John 15, 10. He says, you're my disciples. If you keep, te rao, my commandments, it's, it's a picture. Believers hold on to his commandments. It's the word in Ephesians 4, 3 where it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Did you know every church has the unity of the Spirit? We're just supposed to guard it and hold on to it. We already have it when we became Christ's children. We're just supposed to maintain and, and not let anything happen to it. In fact, Paul used this word in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept. He said, I've never let go. I, I have held on to the faith. Peter assures us that our reservations in heaven, 1 Peter 1, 4, are tereo. Did you know the turning point in understanding salvation is when we realize it's not what I did, whether I prayed the right words enough times and really, 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 really meant it. It's whether or not I believe God meant what he said. And he said, whoever comes to me, I'll never turn him away. Whoever calls on me, I will. I will. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, I will save. Salvation is not what I did. And a lot of people, when I hear their testimony, they say, well, I... You know what it is? It's what God did. I just believe him. I trust him. I receive it. I, I, I called out to him and said, Lord, you have done everything. I want your salvation. And did you know that changes our assurance or our eternal security? Because how Peter put it, he says, your reservations are an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, that is tereod for you in heaven. God says, I'm watching over your reservation in heaven. No one will lose it. Airlines lost mine twice now. I won't lose your reservation in heaven. I'm better than any airline. I'll get you there. Jude tells us in verse 21 of the book of Jude, keep, in fact, you know what? In my Bible, Jude's on the same page. Look, do you see it? If you're in Revelation 1, 3, very close should be the book of Jude. Look what it says in verse 21. The first word of the book of Jude, first chapter, 21st verse says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Actually, that is an imperative. That means that that they were supposed to do something. What they were supposed to do is say, I want to stay in your love. I want to stay trusting that you love me so much that you sent your son, the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I want to keep myself in that love. Now, Isaiah puts it this way. In Isaiah 48, it says, Oh, that you had hearkened to me, then your peace would have been as a river. You see, God's love and peace flows like a river. You know what marks a river? It has a channel. A river out of its channels is destructive. A river staying in its channel is very powerful. And he says, my love is very powerful and it's channeled toward you. The problem is that you were swimming along in that love and you saw something on the bank that looked really interesting. You crawled out of the river and you're kind of like a fish out of water and you're going, you know, and you, you aren't making it. And you say, what's wrong? The Lord says, keep yourselves. Look at Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. It's our choice. 
He is pouring his love toward us. It's like a river. It is unending and grace upon grace. And we can keep ourselves in it or we can say, hmm, pasture looks greener over here. I'm going to stray over here. And when we do that, we begin to feel unsaved. Do you know when Christians are in sin, they don't feel like a Christian? It's because they're out of the river. They're not keeping themselves in his love. It's interesting that the Lord says that we are to tereo, we're supposed to hold on and keep these truths. Well, the next truth, look at verse 10. Um, we're just looking at the lessons of Revelation chapter 1. The 10th verse has the next one. It said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Sunday is the Lord's day. Sunday is not the Sabbath day. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Sunday is not the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was a sign for Israel. It was for them. Now, I know that it's pre-law, and I know that it comes back in the millennium, but Paul tells us in Colossians 2, we do not observe Sabbaths. We are not those who are supposed to not do anything on Saturday. And we're especially not to be those who say, Saturday has become Sunday. We're not supposed to do anything on Sunday either. I mean, wow, two days? Or we just pick. You know what I mean? No, the early church, it wasn't about the Sabbath. Look what it says in verse 10. He says, and I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What day was that? It was Sunday. It was the first day of the week. It was the day Jesus walked out of the tomb, and every one of his slaves could not help, but every Sunday, remember, it was on this day that he walked out conquering death, defeating the devil, and paying the price of my sin, and it was accepted by God, and I, through Christ's resurrection, have endless life. And what they did is, they couldn't help but celebrate his birthday, being firstborn from the dead, every week. And so it began to be called the Lord's Day. It was the day, now you say, uh, how much of it did they give to the Lord? Well, the majority of the early church historians tell us were slaves. And a slave worked for their Roman master from sunup or before until sunset or even after, at least 12 hour work days, at least. And then they were allowed to attend to other things. And these Christians, in the little amount of time, working seven days a week, 12-hour days, they had an incredible 84-hour work week. But they found out that there were gatherings. When they got saved and knew that, that they had salvation in Christ, they found out that the other slaves of God, the other born-again Christians, would gather at night. How do we know they gathered at night? Because Paul was preaching to them, and someone by the name of Eutychus fell out the window. Do you know why his name was Eutychus? Eutychus, too, if you'd have fallen out the window, you know. But uh, I'm sorry, can't help those. I used to be a youth pastor. You have to say that to keep the kids awake. Um, but but they were, they were, after they had been slaves all day long for their masters, they were sitting there listening to this multi-hour sermon from Paul, and he fell asleep. I thought it would be great. I was talking to the deacons about this. I said, why don't we take the backs off the pews, lift them up a little bit, have everybody sit on those, and every time someone fell asleep, they'd fall off, and we'd know. And I thought, no, I can't do that because I can't raise them from the dead like Paul did, so we aren't going to do that. But that was the Lord's day. It belonged to him. The servants of God who gather in his church, gather on the Lord's Day, or Sunday, on the day when Christ rose from the dead to remember his resurrection. Every day is the Lord's Day, but Sundays were especially his. What they said is you control everything, but especially this day I set aside. Do you remember the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Someone said you've never mentioned any of the Ten Commandments. There. Tell someone I mentioned one, the fourth, okay? And the seventh, do not commit adultery. I mean, do you want me to go through all of them? But the fourth commandment was, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What does that mean? Does that mean if you don't go out to eat on Saturday or Sunday that you've somehow made the day holy? Does it mean if you don't mow your lawn, you've made it holy? No, you know what it means? Love demands intimacy. And if love demands intimacy, God so loved his people, the Jews, that he said, I want you to, to devote one day to intimately seeking me. Don't farm, don't do anything else. Come find me and seek after me. Do you know Jesus fulfilled all the law? Do you know for us what it is? Our love for him 
reflective of that fourth commandment is that we want to seek intimacy with him. And we do that by being joined together as a group of living stones into his holy temple when we gather together on the Lord's Day. And when we collectively are together, we become a living temple. And when we sing those wonderful songs we were just singing, that last chorus, and many others, it rises before him. And so we have to make sacrifices. And the early church made those sacrifices. After working all day, 12-hour day, they came at night to hear the teaching of the Word because they couldn't. They had to work all day, and they came then. So that is what should mark this day no matter what else we do. We should worship the one who arose on the first day of the week because he died to purchase us out of the slave market of sin, and we should seek out as many of the other slaves of Christ as we can and identify with them a wonderful thought. You know, next week I'm going to be with a whole bunch of Koreans, Lord willing, and the week after, uh, I just got a note last night, they said, hey, you know, the house churches have never seen someone as old as you. <laughs> Me. They're all in their 20s. Even the missionaries are in their 20s. And they said, they're wondering if, if you could help with the baptisms, they said, because you're so old to show them people can be Christians for 49 years. That's how long I've known the Lord. I mean, that's twice as long as they've been alive, and they just want to see what it looks like. And I thought, wow, next Sunday, seeing these, these people that are just coming to Christ, so many of them being nurtured and discipled, and they gather, by the way, you know how they do it? They gather in apartments, and they, wearing their clothes, sit down in the bathtub with their feet all the way down by the drain, and they lower them down under the water of the bathtub, and everyone cheers and claps and sings, and one after another, they all get baptized in the bathtub. Amazing. The first one, the missionary told me, the first one that they did, they thought you held them under. They thought that they were really buried with Christ, and he was going to resurrect them. And they really willingly thought they were drowning. And one of the ladies, he said she went limp. She had tears running down her face, and she just threw herself under the water. She thought she was going to die that day. And when he pulled her back up, she went, oh, what happened? He said, that's baptism. She said, I thought you were going to kill me. That's how devoted they are. Amazing. Sunday is the Lord's Day. And the question is, do I seek to magnify Christ on his day? Not whether you do something that someone thinks you shouldn't do. Do you do what your master thinks you should do on this day? That's what a slave wants to know. Next, Revelation was for the local church. Look at verse 11. Look at those specific geographic descriptions. He was not talking to kind of the church of the air that listened on the radio. He was talking to a geographically identifiable local group in these cities. By using specific local geographic descriptions, the emphasis is upon an identifiable group of believers that would actually receive and hear this letter. Wow. The church has always been characterized by being a a gathering together of belief. By the way, the church was never intended for evangelism, this service. Did you know that? Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, if an unbeliever happened to come in, they'd think you guys are crazy. Do you know what he said? If an unbeliever ever happened to come in, that was obviously, he wasn't telling them to go get every unsaved person and bring them in. You can't. We're going to evangelize them and make them comfortable here. And we're going to do nothing to offend them and hope maybe they'll get saved. No. He said, you go out and lead them to Christ. And after you're sure they're saved, you bring them to church. That's how it started. By the way, it changed in the, the, the church changed to having unsaved people come actually in the time of an American evangelist named Charles Grandison Finney in the 1830s. He shocked everybody. The early church never let unbelievers in. The early church did not allow unsaved people in, especially in the first, second, and third century. It was a gathering only of the redeemed to be strengthened, to be encouraged, that went out to evangelize. We've changed all that. Not sure we've biblically changed that. We've just culturally changed it. But Finney said, bring them in, and I'll preach to them, and then they'll come forward. And the whole idea of an invitation in church is so foreign to the New Testament church. But I don't know how I got off on that. But it's to the local church. And so we should always want to be identified with a visible local group of believers that are attentively obeying the Word of God. The question is not what the facility is like and what the program is like. The question is how attentive is that group of people to the Word of God? How much do they see themselves as slaves of Christ? Not what the cars look like in the parking lot. 
or what the people dress like or how many business contacts I might get at that church. It's how, how attentive they are to the master and to the wishes of the master in his word. Next, in verse 12, Christ says, my attention is on my church. Jesus is shown to be at the center of the church. You notice he's walking around those seven lampstands. Jesus is seen completely focused on his church. He's in the midst. He's looking them over. So you know what that tells me? The measure of my life is how much my desire is like Christ's desire. Where is Jesus looking right now? We know from Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus ever lives to do his priestly, high priestly work in his church. That's what it says in Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. He is constantly devoting his life right this moment to the church. If if my master is absolutely focused on this and I love my master, I will focus on that with him. See, that's, that's what the early church caught They wanted their life to share Christ's focus upon believers being encouraged and trained and strengthened and challenged and kept healthy. And if you're involved in anything that helps believers get encouraged and strengthened and kept healthy and challenged to serve the Lord, then you are focused on what your master is focused on. And that pleases him. And finally, verse 13, and onward, Christ is emphasizing his work to keep the church healthy. You know, someone, someone asked me, they says, uh, how do you get that priest thing, you know? And, and when you get the priest thing, how do you get the priest in health? And I says, did you know in the Old Testament that the priests were the health inspectors of the Jews? Did you know it was the priests that determined clean and unclean food? If you read Leviticus, you know those really boring parts that you like to flip over? They were the the inspectors of houses. They looked for mold. They looked for, they were combing through people's hair, if they had hair, looking for scabs, looking for leprosy, looking for hair that turned color and was a sign that it was more than just a surface disease. They were the blood-borne pathogen and the, and the people that were looking at how disease was transmitted. That's what the Jewish priests were. Yeah, they would run the, the temple sacrifices, But what they do all the rest of the time? They were the ones that were out keeping the community healthy. That was the book of Leviticus, if you look at it, it's all about keeping the community's diet and communicable diseases in check and keeping them healthy. Did you know what Jesus is doing? He wants to keep his church healthy. That's what the great high priest is. He doesn't mean no colds. He's talking about no spiritual infections. That's Christ's priority. Well, who is he working on? Uh, look, look next is in chapter 2, verse 7. I want to introduce you to a thought. True believers are described in the New Testament church as overcomers, okay? Let me show you what I mean. True believers are overcomers. To, to each church of the seven in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus said, those who hear me and who really respond to me are believers, and I call them overcomers. Now, remember, John the apostle, wrote the Gospel of John, three little postcards, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then he wrote the Revelation. In Revelation, he uses the word overcomer, and Christ does too, but he defines it in the book of 1st John. That's where it says, who is he that overcomes the world? And, And by this we know that we're in Christ because his love is in us and we overcome the world and we don't love the world. And so we see a true believer is an overcomer. So look what he says in chapter 2, verse 7. As true believers, those who truly are Christ's children in his church, they have this abundant life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, Revelation 2, 7. To him who overcomes, that's to all who are true believers, I will give to eat from the tree of life. We have this abundant life. Uh, Jesus said this, uh, The devil came to kill, this is John 10, he came to kill and steal and destroy, but I'm come that you might have life and life, what? More abundant. What what is that? I'm giving you to eat of the tree of life. You have this overflowing, never hunger, never thirst life. It's abundant. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. 
True believers have an indestructible life. He who has near, let him hear what the Spirit says. Verse 11, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We're having a little discussion in Michigan, especially around Grand Rapids, whether the second death hurts. It does. Jesus said it does. He says, if, if you're a true believer, you will not be hurt by the second death. You will not suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. You will not suffer the blackness of darkness forever. You will not hear God say, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting punishment that I intended for the devil and his angels, but you joined him. He says, if you are a true believer, look at verse 11, you will never feel the hurt of the second death. You know what that means? We have indestructible life. You know, Hebrews puts it this way, you live after the power of an endless life. What a wonder to know that. Thirdly, look at verse 17 of chapter 2. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give hidden manna. We have this inexhaustible supply. Do you remember the children of Israel? They were out in the desert. They were out in, in land. The Sinai is 120 uh, during the day, and it goes down to 40 at night. I mean, it's just the most inhospitable place. And you know what the Lord did? There were no Walmart super centers, and there was no way for them to get fed, so he dropped them food on the ground every morning when they woke up. It was fresh manna from God. And they had an inexhaustible supply of everything they needed to make it through life. That is such a picture of the Lord saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And my words, when you find them, you eat them, and they satisfy your soul. The Lord says, I give you an inexhaustible supply. I'll give you hidden manna to eat and a white stone and a new name. Look at verse 26. Here's the fourth overcomer passage. True believers have an inexpressible future. You know, people love to look forward to things. Well, here's something to look forward to. Verse 26. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. See that keeps stuff, holds on, guards, doesn't let go of, doesn't ever stop believing. True believers never stop believing. If you keep my works to the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Verse 27, a quote from Psalm 2. Christ rules them with a rod of iron and they're dashed in pieces. As I also have received from my Father, verse 28, I will give him the morning star. Now, Two promises there that are inexpressible. The Lord says we're going to have something we never have had on earth. Ruling on earth is tenuous at best. Look at the Gaddafi. He only got 40 years before their question. Look at Mubarak. He's, look at Stop. None of those guys have been able to hold on to rule very long. You know what the Lord says? I'll give you a place of ruling over the nations. But that's nice. I mean, I don't know who wants to rule, but if he gives it to us, great. How do you like that other thing? The morning star... I mean, people have mansions and they have possessions and they burn down and get stolen and they get old and have to give them up. The Lord says, I'll give you the morning star. You know, I'm not sure what that is, but it's an inexpressible future, an indescribable anticipation of what he promised us who are his. Look at chapter 3. In verse 5, here's the next overcomer. True believers have an incredible coverage. You know, my insurance agent called me a while back, and he says, man, I mean, it was several years ago. He says, you've got eight kids. He says, if you kick the bucket, if you croak, he says, they would never be able to pay all those bills. He says, you need more coverage. And he says, and, you know, someone could sue you, and you need this umbrella thing. And so he really worked out good coverage. You want to know what good coverage is? Look at verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed, covered, incredibly covered, with white garments, and I will not blot his name from the book of life, but I will, look at our coverage, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Did you know we are going to be personally introduced to our Heavenly Father? Remember in my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. Before we get our key and go to our room, the Lord's going to walk us up. He's going to say, Father in heaven, I want you to meet my child. And he introduces us to the Father. And all the angels are going to look on. And it says in 1 Peter, 
that they search, try and understand what all this is about because they don't get in on it. They can't believe that us desperados are clothed and introduced to God. That is great coverage, if you ask me. And look at verse 12. Uh, it says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. I love this. This is our inescapable destination. You can't escape it. He shall go out no more. You, you won't ever lose your spot. I, look at this. I will write on him the name of my God. Last night we had our annual tax preparation and mailing. We got all the kids at the table, ran out their turbo tax, you know, so they get their $1 refund. And I had them tear up their stuff and staple, and, and they got their envelopes, and I says, now, I want you to write on your envelope, Department of Treasury, State of Michigan, you know, give me my money back, you know, and, um, and it was amazing to them to realize that you can identify, out of seven billion people on this planet, you can get a letter to one with only three lines of information. Their name, well, there are thousands of people with the same name, and so it's their name, at that street and number, but there are hundreds of streets, and all those numbers are pretty much the same. But when you combine that name with that street and number, with that city and state and country, bingo. You have one out of seven billion that's instantly identified and can get that letter. Look what the Lord, he does the very same thing, three lines. He says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, there's one line, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out, and I will write on him the new name that I gave him. There's all three lines of the address. You know what? We have been written at the point of salvation. We have a little address label on us. If you could see spiritually, if you could put on glasses and see as God sees, you'd see we've got an address label on us. You know, I, I took all those this morning at 6.15 and went down here to the post office and jammed them in that little slot, and they got all mixed up with all the other hundreds of letters there. But you know what? Someone or some machine is going to take one out, and they're going to look right at that little address label, and they're going to throw it in the right bag, and it's going to end up in Fresno or Lansing or wherever it was supposed to go. You know what? We got saved. We got our address label on us, and we get thrown in with the other billions on this earth. But the day is coming when we are going to come to the point where it's time to get to our destination and the Lord's going to look at that address label. And that's why a group of people in, Revel in Matthew 7 get up there and they're standing in front of the Lord and he looks at their address label and they says, hey, let us in. He says, yeah, you were in the church, weren't you? And you did all kinds of great stuff. But he says, you never knew me. You never got this personal, intimate address label for me. You don't have a new name. You don't have a new spirit. You don't have a new heart. You're not mine. Depart from me. This is what true believers have. We have an inescapable destination. Verse 13, if you have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says. And here's the last one. True believers, we have intimacy with God. Look at chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. You know what that means? Can you imagine that throne we read about in chapter 4? It is unbelievably huge. It's like emerald, and it's got a rainbow all the way around it. It's on this glassy sea, and there he is sitting on it, and guess what? We get to sit next to him. You know what that means? Salvation is so personal. It's not a group event. The Lord says, I'm going to let you come up and sit with me, and you go, hi. <laughs> wow, I can't believe I'm here, you know. He'll talk with us. He says, I am offering you intimacy. If you have an ear to hear, verse 22. And by the way, he, he offered that earlier. Remember, I knock at the door. The Lord wants to have that same intimate sitting with us. Instead of on his throne, he wants to sit at your table with you, or he wants to sit while you're drinking coffee, or he wants to sit while you're in your office cubicle or at school, and he wants to commune with us on a daily basis. We meet with him on the other side of this book. He talks to us through it. This is our conduit. The intimacy we're going to have in heaven, he offers to us on a daily basis. He'll meet just with us. Well, now this gets into chastening, okay? 
we are those people that have abundant life and an instructable life and an inexhaustible supply and this future and this coverage and this destination and intimacy. What happens when we aren't doing what our master wants us to do? What does he do? And I'm going to close with this, and this is where we'll pick up next time. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I'll just read it to you. Hebrews 12. Back up, book of Hebrews. This is the most important thing. Don't miss it. Um, we have exactly three minutes, and I'm going to show you three things. God only chastens his own children, and his chastening has three specific levels. And this is where we're going to pick up next time. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. So that's a choice. Either we can get rid of what trips us up, or as we'll see in verse 5, he'll take care of it. So he offers us, get rid of it. Now, look at verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Now, do you remember the context? But to as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become the what? Sons of God. So he's talking to believers. And this exhortation in verse 5 is speaking to us as sons. My son, my true child, born again into my family, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son. Hmm, that sounds not very good. If you endure chastening, verse 7, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there that the father does not chasten? Verse 8, if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, you are illegitimate and not sons. What is this talking about? Next verse. Um, I mean, the rest of that verse no, it's verse 9. Furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us. We paid them respect. Look at verse 9, the end. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits? There comes that slave thing again. When we don't act like his slave, he does this. What does he do? Number one, he rebukes us. Look at verse 5. Stage one is rebuke. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked. How does God rebuke us? Many ways. A prick of our conscience, a timely word from another person. Do you remember David when he was starting to tumble after in his sin for Bathsheba? He had already, you know, decided he wanted her, and he was going after her, and one of his servants looked up at him and said, she's married to someone else. See, that was a timely word. That was a rebuke from God to David. He just blew it off. Sometimes it's it's another person, like David got, rebuking us. Sometimes it's a scripture. Sometimes it's through the preaching of God's word. Sometimes it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit as we read God's word. But God rebukes us. What does he rebuke us about? When we're not being a slave. When we're doing our own thing. When we say, well, you're not as important. When we crawl out of the river of his love and start going after greener grass, he rebukes us. Look at the second one. Verse 5 continues. For whom the Lord loves he chastens. There's a second level. Rebuke is just, it's just that little prick of conscience. It's that little word from someone saying, are you sure you should be doing that? Chastening is different. It's, it's used throughout the New Testament interchangeably with discipline, but it, it speaks of, of a focused discipline. It's really the word spank. Chastening is sometimes something you feel like emotional anxiety. Should I be doing this? Or frustration. Why is everything going wrong? Or distress. I can't believe this is happening to me. What used to bring you joy doesn't. When a Christian is chastened, their pressures increase at work, at home, in our health, or our finances. And what's amazing is many Christians bump along at that level. And they, they don't respond to it. You see, the Bible says that when we're full of the Spirit, we're filled with joy that's, that's overflowing. Well, what happens to these Christians? They feel unfulfilled at church. They're critical of other Christian friends. They feel out with God. When they pick up the Bible, it feels like lead instead of a welcome relief. And the Lord seems to be making them sad and they feel lethargic toward him. When they think about the Lord, there's just kind of this Huh. That's chastening. You know what that is? Removing the joy of our salvation. It was removed from David. He says, Lord, don't remove it anymore. I'll do anything to keep you from 
taking away the joy of my salvation. Finally, look at the last stage. Look at verse 6. It gets worse. This is where we'll pick up next time. And scourges every son. Scourge is literally the word in the New Testament to whip and inflict punishment. It's the same word in the Gospels used to describe what the Romans did to Jesus. It's excruciating pain. And you know what the Lord says? If you don't take a rebuke, you hear that in the message, a friend shares a verse with you, and all of a sudden you go into this lethargic, everything is awful, frustrated, uh, going through life like this, which is not how Christians are to go through life. He said, if you don't respond to that, I'll take you to stage three. I will scourge you. And as we'll see next time, he scourges the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 very clearly. Let's bow for a word of prayer this morning. Father in heaven, I pray that you would open our hearts to the truth of your word, that you are our master, and you will not tolerate us serving another master We can't serve two masters. We can't love the one and hold to the other. We cannot serve you, O God, and our own physical, fleshly, worldly desires. So I pray that we'd respond to your rebukes, even today, what you point out to us that you want changed. I pray that we'd respond to your chastening, that we would snap out of the lethargy and the coldness by repenting whatever we're holding on to that's displeasing you. And I pray that that we would know that you are chastening us and scourging and rebuking us out of love because you have given us such incredible delights in Christ. You don't want us eating out of the garbage can of this world. So, Lord, I pray that you would move in our hearts. May we do your will, not our own. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.